Today's Friday Forum is made possible by Bank of the Cascades, CenturyLink, Family Care Health Plan, Miller Nash, The Standard, and Stoll Reeves. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland Friday Forum. I am John Horvick, City Club President, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike. Those of you who join us today at the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB Radio or watching on Portland Community Media. Today, Nicole Maher will facilitate a conversation about equal pay, income inequality, and the minimum wage. But first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are Bank of the Cascades, CenturyLink, Family Care Health Plans, Miller Nash, The Standard, and Stoll Reeves. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. This morning, City Club released a draft report that recommends changes to Portland's water and sewer bureaus to improve oversight and build ratepayer confidence and a no vote on the May ballot measure. You can read the executive summary and download the full report on our website. City Club members will vote on the report and its recommendations prior to next week's forum. Doors will open at 11 and the presentation will begin at 11.30. Voting will occur at the meeting and online. The results will be published on Thursday, March 20th. After the vote, Mayor Charlie Hales will deliver his State of the City address. Upcoming Friday forums in March also include the State of Our Health, a conversation with Elliot Mainzer, the new administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration. And be sure to check out City Club's After Hours forums, including a discussion about Oregon's initiative process on March 14th at the Green Dragon. You can learn more about these and other club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, City Club will be live tweeting at today's event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club, and be sure to use the hashtag City Club in your own tweets. We'll be having a Q&A session with our speakers at the end of today's program. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your questions. And for all our audience participants, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables during the forum and write your questions on them. We'll collect them prior to the start of the Q&A. And now to our program. Tomorrow is the 106th International Women's Day, which celebrates women's economic, political, and social achievements. <laughs> to honor this day and to raise awareness of the disparities that still exist, we will discuss equal pay, income inequality, and the minimum wage with today's panelists. To help lead this discussion is Nicole Maher, President and CEO of Northwest Health Foundation and current member of City Club's Board of Governors. Previously, she served as Executive Director of the Native American Youth and Family Center. She holds a Master's in Public Health from the Mark Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University, and two bachelor degrees, one in Public Health and another in American Indian Studies from Oregon State University. Nicole, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I am so pleased to be here and to help facilitate one of the most important conversations of our time. Incredibly relevant, and we couldn't have better people here with us today to have this discussion. Before we jump into that discussion, I'd like to start by introducing our esteemed panelists. On my far left, Brad Avakian has served as, the Oregon's, as Oregon's Commissioner of Labor and Industries since being elected in 2008. Previously, he served in the Oregon St Senate where he worked to pass the Oregon Equality Act of 2007 to expand civil rights and protection for LGBTQ Oregonians in employment and housing. Prior to that, he led an incredibly successful civil rights practice, and he graduated from Oregon State University and Lewis and Clark Law School. <laughs> to 
to Commissioner Avakian's right, we have Jessica Nelson. Jessica has been an employment economist with the Oregon Employment Department since 2005. She studies and reports on economic trends with a specific focus on the types of work Oregonians do, including employment, wages, vacancies, outlook, and education. She also holds a Master of Public Policy from Oregon State University. To her right, we have Josh Lehner, an economist with Oregon's Office of Economic Analysis. He develops the quarterly Oregon economic forecast, including projections for employment, personnel income, and wages. He also develops the Oregon, Le Oregon Index of Leading Indicators, and he holds a BA in economics from the University of Colorado and a master's in science and economics from Portland State University. Moving right along to his right, we have Roberta Philip Robbins, who co-chairs the Oregon Council for Civil Rights. Before taking her current role with Multnomah County as a specialist in affirmative action and equal employment opportunity, Roberta served as a senior policy advisor to Multnomah County Chair Jeff Kogan. Previously, she was the director of policy and programs for the National Crittenden Foundation, whose mission is to empower girls, young women, and families. She is a graduate of Lewis and Clark Law School, where she created a mentoring program to reach underserved youth in North Portland. And last but not least, Roberta's co-chair is Sunny Petit. Who all, she's the co-chair of the Oregon Council for Civil Rights, and she also is the executive director for the Center for Women, Politics, and Policy at Portland State University. Prior to joining the center in 2007, she directed programs to counter human trafficking in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Please help me in welcoming our phenomenal panel today. So our first question is actually directed at Commissioner Avakian. We'd love to kick our discussion off and invite you to describe Boley's role with respect to equal pay, income inequality, and the minimum wage. If you could also include the role of the Council of Civil Rights, that would be wonderful. Well, thank you, Nicole. And, and let me also say thanks to the City Club for all the wonderful events you host, but especially today as we talk about the very important subject to Oregon's economy, uh, equal pay and, and wage inequality. Let me start with a little bit of an overview of what we're doing at the Bureau of Labor and Industries in order to build a stronger workforce and economy uh, for every Oregonian. You know, everyone deserves to have a, a fair shot at a job and to be treated fairly uh, once they have it. Uh, and so we protect and we train Oregon's workers to that end, as well as uh, help Oregon's employers through our technical assistance program to understand the complicated state and federal employment laws so that they can be successful too. And to give you an idea about the scope of that work, we get about 60,000 calls a year from Oregonians that have questions about their rights on the job or in housing. That'll boil down to about 5,000 formal investigations. Uh, and in recent years, that has meant about $20 million back into the pockets of workers who have been treated unfairly on the job. And you might find it interesting that the complaints that lead to those investigations uh, aren't just from workers. Uh, we get calls from employers that want to make sure that they've got a level playing field in which to compete. It just isn't fair uh, that you would have to compete with an employer that is artificially decreasing wages or in other ways skirting the law in order to gain an unfair advantage. And so we do that work both for the benefit of Oregon businesses and for the benefit of Oregon workers. We also see, oversee Oregon's minimum wage. Oregonians really got it right back in 2002 when we passed our voter approved initiative that tied Oregon's minimum wage to the consumer price index so that our lowest wage earners never lose pace with the rising cost of goods and services. And others around the nation have recognized the success of this as well. About a year ago, uh, Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa, uh, who had a bill patterned much after Oregon's linkage to the, minimum, to the uh, Consumer Price Index called uh, and said, could you come back to DC 
talk to the committee about Oregon's successful experience with its minimum wage, and I was very pleased uh, to do it. Uh, and what I told them was, Oregon has had seen great success with its minimum wage in doing this. It not only has benefited workers and their families by not losing pace with the rising cost of goods and services, but it's provided a predictable, a modest, a steady type of increase for businesses to plan into the going, uh, coming year. And it gives consumers greater purchasing power in order to participate in local economies. Minimum wage earners are not socking away their money in 401ks and mutual funds. Virtually every time they get is reinvested in a local business as they buy gas and food and school supplies uh, for their kids. We're also working very successfully to attract women and people of color into apprenticeship so that they can get a great start on a living wage career. Uh, without, by the way, a mountain of school debt. In recent years as well, we've graduated over 7,000 apprentices into great uh, living wage jobs uh, through those apprenticeship programs. Now, there isn't any shortcut to building a strong middle class in Oregon or in the country. What it means is that we have to add jobs and we have to grow our economy, and the way to do that is to prove to the world that we have got the best trained and the most ready workforce that you can find anywhere. And, and that starts with the return of 21st century shop classes to our middle schools and high schools. Now this is one of the top priorities for the Bureau. Uh, and we're not talking only about the return of wood shop and metal shop and welding, the things you think about when you think of a shop class, those are coming back. But we're also talking about 21st century manufacturing technologies, biomedical engineering, pre-med, uh, graphic design and computer sciences, various renewable energy uh, industry sectors. To date, this effort has meant the restoration of these kinds of programs to 161 middle schools and high schools in Oregon. And that's just the beginning as we bring this back for every child in the state. Now, I mentioned our role in civil rights enforcement, protecting people uh, on the job, in housing, and in all public places. And that's why uh, I pulled together some civil rights-minded folks and created the Oregon Council on Civil Rights. The first task they took up was equal pay for equal work. Women in Oregon still only earn about 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. People of color earn even less. This is real, but it's something that we can do something about. The council has delivered a terrific set of recommendations to me and to the Bureau, and what is clear from those is that there's no single overarching solution to ending wage disparity. But as you're going to hear today, there are various policy recommendations that will modernize our workplaces and build a stronger and a more diverse workforce and economy for the state. Oregon does not have to accept economic insecurity and inequality, and we will not be waiting for Congress or anybody else to act first. Thank you so much. Uh, Sunny, as the co-chair of the Council of Civil Rights, can you talk about the impetus for the Council's recent report on pay inequality in Oregon, and please describe the process that you went through to get there? Sure. So the Oregon Council for Civil Rights, under the wise leadership of then-chair um, Stephen Ying and Don Holt in 2011, started to look at this issue after talking with Commissioner Brad Avakian. Um, one of the issues was is that you know the workforce has changed, but our policies really haven't. Right now, women serve as about two-thirds of breadwinners or co-breadwinners of their families across the United States. 
And what we still know is that women are making, as Commissioner Vakian said, 79 cents to the dollar, and that that problem is even greater for people of color, especially women of color. We started looking at policies and data internationally. We tried to distill information of, of work that was being done in different parts of the world, um, nationally, in different states and localities, to try to find what are the main drivers of this issue and how can we find the best solutions for something that would work in Oregon. This included a process of talking with labor advocates, of small businesses, medium and large sized businesses, talking with other advocates. Um, we, we did a lot of work looking at the economic data and tried to find some ways that we knew would be helpful in Oregon. We had a forum in Portland and around the state as well to bring in public input and public opinion. Um, and what we found, and one of the reasons I'm so appreciative of having City Club host this today, is that it's a really very extensive issue. It's not just something, as the commissioner said, it's not just a one piece thing that can be flicked. You know, it's not a switch that's flipped and all of a sudden it's solved, but it's, it's complex and there are many drivers in it. Um, the ones that we found and we really focused on were looking at pay disparity education, bias in the workplace, and looking at work-life conflict. For the workplace, so many women face discrimination, not only in recruitment, but in prejudice and bias when we look at the higher likelihood of them stepping away from, from their work to help care for a family member. For education, we found that Oregon really needs to do more to attract women, and specifically people of color, into higher earning majors such as STEM fields, um, but also add in apprenticeship and on-the-job training. For work-life conflict, one of the things that we were struck by was that when we, um, you know, that we compound the issue of workplace bias and occupational segregation, but women are often expected to do what we call the second shift when they get home. They're less likely to work in a setting that provides paid sick time or for time off for caregiving or school activities. And the takeaway from all of this is that the impact of the pay gap, it compounds over time. So we're not just talking about your paycheck today. We're talking about your retirement benefits. We're talking about housing security. And we're talking about long-term savings. So I think when we get this right, especially when we're talking about uh, two-thirds of women being breadwinners or co-breadwinners in their family, um, we know that doing things around this issue are going to make a huge difference, not only in the lives of those women, but in their families and in the entire community. So Roberta, you played a major role and a major leadership role in this effort. What were some of the things that you found really surprising and what were some of the solutions that you all recommended? Thanks for that question, Nicole. You know, to be honest, one of the biggest surprises for me was to learn that the motherhood penalty even existed, that there is a very real thing called the motherhood penalty. And to see on paper the economic hit that moms take as a result of having and raising a child is very real. I mean, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that this motherhood penalty, which compares moms to dads, shows that women who have children will see their paychecks go down while fathers will see their paychecks go up during that time. In fact, uh, moms generally make only 60 cents to the dollar of what fathers make. And as Sunny mentioned, compounded over time, over a lifetime, these wage disparities add up to about $434,000 in lost earnings over a woman's working lifetime. Another surprising thing to me is that once you get beyond the statistic, we all, we've heard the 77 cents nationally um, that women make on, their, on the male dollar. That actually gets worse for certain professions and it gets worse when you look at the, the earnings of women of color. Latinas, for example, earn just 59 cents to a man's dollar, and black women earn just 68 cents. It's not limited either to just low-wage positions. In fact, the Oregon State Bar survey, uh, just released, 2012 survey, uh, not just released, 2012, shows that women lawyers starting out will make a lot less than their male counterparts, for instance. 
You know, Sunny talked about the need to attract more women and people of color into well-paying positions, and it's important. It is one of our key recommendations in this report. Uh, but when you drill down even deeper, one, another surprising thing we found is that when you look at one of the few well-paying positions in which women make up the vast majority of workers in that field, uh, in that field of um, healthcare diagnostics and treating practitioners, women actually make up 70% of the workforce, they are still only making 60 cents for every dollar made by their male counterparts. Again, we, there are some major steps we can take to change this reality. One of those things is supporting businesses by including technical assistance and access to best practices. Encouraging more women and people of color to pursue STEM education and apprenticeship pathways. Let's reward and celebrate the people in our community who are doing the right things. Strengthen protections against retaliation and ensure that all employees have the right to request flexibility and time off and that there's not a penalty associated with even asking for it. Let's modernize our workplace and leave laws to include more resources for childcare and implementing family-friendly policies that help working parents who are struggling to make ends meet. The bottom line, Nicole, really is this. Oregon does not need to wait for Congress to act. In fact, this is something we can solve with concerted focus and attention. We need to take action now so that we can build a stronger economy for everybody. Thank I'm not sure if I'm allowed to clap as the moderator, but I just did. <laughs> um, thank you so much for those specific recommendations. And even though some of the statistics are really startling, they're incredibly helpful to really demonstrate that, that we do have a challenge. Uh, Jessica, let's invite some of our economists to the conversation. Jessica, what does the data show about our Oregon experience with respect to equal pay, not just across gender lines, but also across ethnic groups, particularly in a time where we're seeing our young people of Oregon become so incredibly diverse. So Oregon is really pretty similar to the nation, um, both in terms of gender gaps and in terms of uh, earnings gaps between different um, race and ethnic groups. Um, looking at data from the Census Bureau, from 2008 to, to 2012, Oregon women working full time and all year long made on average 77% of men's earnings. Now, women tend to work part-time more often than men, so if you look at all workers in Oregon, um, the gap gets even greater. Um, so, for all workers, um, women's earnings in Oregon were 68% of men's. In terms of uh, race and ethnic groups, the level of earnings is highest among Asians and whites, no matter the gender. Um, and that's true both in Oregon and the nation. For Oregon men, median earnings ranged from less than 29,000 for Hispanic men working full-time and year-round, to black men earning about 40, 42,000, to about 49,000 for white men, and 54,000 for Asian men with similar work schedules. For women, earnings of full-time workers ranged from less than 26,000 among Hispanic women, to about 36,000 for black women, and more than 37,000 for white and Asian women. So I'm gonna take a moment now and talk about unemployment rates too because I think it's important to realize that this recession that we went through several years ago and then the recovery has looked very different um, for, <clears throat> um, for folks depending on race and ethnicity. Um, unemployment rates came down for everybody last year, um, for all groups, um, everybody saw a decrease. But for blacks, the rate is still more than twice as high as for whites. In 2013, it was 17.6% of blacks in Oregon unemployed. The rate for Hispanics in Oregon was 11.1%, so that's better, um, but it's still a lot higher than the rate of 7.8% for whites. So Oregon's unemployment rate has been on a downward trend for the last four and a half years, but I think it's important that we realize that some folks are seeing a better labor market than others. Thank you. Let's switch gears to Josh. Uh, so Josh, we actually have one of the highest minimum wages in the United States. 
What does the data show about our experience with its impact on job gains and losses and our overall poverty rate? Thanks, Nicole. Uh, and thank you to the City Club for having us here for this, this forum on an important topic. Um, overall, there's actually a pretty strong economic consensus in terms of what the impact of a higher minimum wage is. Uh, basically, it shows that there will be small job losses to zero job losses, somewhere in that range between small to slightly negative. Uh, and it's been confirmed by many, many different academic studies. Uh, and that's just the trade-off for people down near the minimum wage and low-wage workers more broadly. If you step back and look at the overall economy here in the Northwest, either Oregon or Washington or California for that matter, uh, it's really hard to discern an overall impact. Our, our job growth over the last 10, 15 years has been right in line with the median state. Uh, that might shock you a little bit, you know, being 25th best in the country doesn't sound that good, but if you counter, or if you factor in that the 2001 recession hit Oregon uh, harder than almost every other single state in the country due to our, our concentration in the high-tech manufacturing. We also had a larger housing bubble and bust uh, in places like Bend and Medford in particular. So we had two really nasty recessions here in Oregon, and on net, we're still middle of the pack. Washington did even better. They're somewhere around 15th best in terms of job growth. Um, and so it's really hard to see that there's an overall impact on the statewide economic trends just due to the minimum wage because it's such a small um, subsector of the overall economy, although it's important for the workers at the low wage occupations uh, in terms of overall economic growth, GDP, income, things like that, it, it doesn't have that much of an overall impact. In terms of poverty rates right now, Oregon is about one percentage point above the U.S. average, I believe. Uh, prior to the recession, we were more in line with the U.S. average, so Oregon tends to follow the national trends. Our business cycles are more volatile than the average state, but overall we do follow the, the, the U.S. trends by and large. So thanks for talking about how we weathered the recession and some of those trends, but how are we, when you compare our income inequality to other states, do we have more inequality, do we have less? What is your perspective on that? Um, Oregon is pretty much the average state, or excuse me, the median state in terms of all these income inequality measures. You look at something called the Gini coefficient. That's a measure that looks at the dispersion of income. How much is concentrated up and down the income spectrum? Are they close together, far apart? Uh, that's what, what the Gini coefficient measures. And Oregon is below the U.S. average, but we're right in line with the median state. Uh, you look at things like the share of income going to the top 1%, share of income going to the top 10%, uh, you see the exact same trends where we're below average but we're right in line, sort of the middle of the pack. Uh, two of the... Two big reasons for that are a lot of the high income earners tend to be in headquarter operations, they tend to be CEOs and corporate executives, and also related to the finance industry. Those are two things here in Oregon that were kind of average or below average. We only have two Fortune 500 companies. We lost our one major bank headquarters about 10, 15 years ago when U.S. Bank uh, relocated to Minneapolis. And so we, 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 do, we don't tend to have a lot of these large headquarter operations or much of the finance industry, particularly related to the investment banking. And that's where a lot of those high income earners. So not surprisingly, where you see the states with the most inequality are places like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, California, these types of places that do have uh, big businesses and investment banking and the like. The other states at the top of the list tend to be Florida, Texas, Wyoming, Nevada, places like that, that are a little bit more geographically diverse or they're economically diverse in terms of what's driving that overall inequality. But overall, Oregon follows the national trends and we're kind of in the middle of the pack. So I hear you saying we don't have as much inequality, but part of that is because we don't have as many people making high, high wages. Is that the takeaway that what the audience would come away with today? Uh, to a certain extent. Uh, we, we have just as many as the median state, so right there in the middle of the pack, but the income inequality even skews further when you look at the further up the income spectrum you go or the further you dive down into the exact locations. And again, that northeast corridor where you have all those investment houses, your head funds and investment banks and the like, uh, that really skews the whole U.S. average up even further. Okay. Thanks for that clarification, Josh. So this next que question is for Commissioner Avakian. Why has legislation like the Oregon Equal Pay Act and Unlawful Discrimination in Employment Act not eliminated the gender and race disparities in compensa compensation? Oregon has uh, a history of real leadership when it comes uh, to the issue, uh, despite the hurdle that we still face in bringing down the wage gap today. And we passed our Equal Pay Act in 1955, a full eight years uh, ahead of Congress acting. Uh, but what our experience shows is that we're not going to eliminate the wage gap uh, through the enforcement of individual uh, cases alone. Instead, 
uh, what, we, uh, what we want to see is a concerted effort to shift the business culture uh, to a more uh, family and woman-friendly set of policies in workplaces. Now, these types of things could include flexible work schedules, uh, uh, different ways of interviewing for hiring and for uh, promotions, training opportunities, maybe even a way to recognize employers that voluntarily adopt and implement these types of new family-friendly policies. And you know, smart employers are already starting to take the lead with this kind of a thing. They understand that a more diverse workforce is a stronger workforce, and they also know that if they want to compete, they have got to attract the top talent. And these types of policies help them do that. Now, the Technical Assistance for Employers program that we've got at the Bureau receives about 20,000 calls a year from businesses who are uh, trying to navigate their way through complicated state and federal laws. And this is going to be a perfect resource for Oregon's businesses to learn how to implement these types of best practices in the workplace, uh, and in doing so, move to a much more woman and fran family friendly business environment. Thank you. Sunny, can you clear up the difference between equal pay for equal work and equal pay for comparable work? And if you could also just talk about how employers could be trained to assess these comparable jobs, that would be really helpful. Sure. And that's a question that comes up a lot. Um, equal pay for equal work, I think one of the cases that we look at is like the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, where she and her male counterpart were doing the same job, but being paid differently. Comparable worth, it, it describes jobs that are similar, but not necessarily identical in skill, education, responsibilities, and in working conditions, but they're rewarded differently. So courts have found that uh, jobs can be substantially equal, but um, to fall under the Equal Pay Act, but an employer can't, for example, uh, change the job title of female workers in order to pay them less, which is a good thing. <laughs> Um, one of the challenges right now is that even with our existing equal pay laws, it's hard for private sector workers to even know what their co-workers make. And it's hard to fix what you can't measure. We should close this loophole so that people can discuss their salary information without fear of retaliation. Um, and I have my notes here because this is kind of a meaty subject and I want to make sure that um, I'm giving you the exact piece. Well, another piece of this is the importance of providing su support and assistance to businesses that want to end the pay gap within their organization. And this is right back to what the commissioner was talking about. They want to implement family-friendly workplace policies to attract and retain talent. Um, and so that's something that we think will be very helpful. Now, a comparable worth assessment. And this is where we get to the question of how businesses can assess what they're doing. And this is often referred to as a pay equity audit. This may include evaluation of all jobs within one organization. Um, points are assigned according to the level of knowledge and responsibility required to do the job, and salary adjustments are commensurate with any disparities by which women are consistently paid less than men for jobs assessed at similar point values. And pay equity audits can help organizations evaluate jobs of comparable worth and really put numeric rigor around that analysis so they can ensure they're not undervaluing jobs in a way that unfairly affects women and people of color. Um, this can also help organizations determine whether they need to make these adjustments. And it's not about bringing salaries down. This is actually um, looking at adjusting wages um, for higher to up to higher earning positions. And the problem is really real. And so one of the benefits of doing these pay equity audits is that you provide a better system of system level data in the organization as well. Roberta, the council report recommends more educational and occupational programs to increase opportunities for women in traditionally male dominated academic and professional fields. Is this solely an issue of access or are there other issues and reasons for lower representation in, of women in these fields? There are many pieces at play, Nicole. You know, one of the most important things we can do is to encourage more young people, more young women and women of color, people of color, to pursue these well-paying career paths. 
And we need to do that by providing early access so that they can find out what they're interested in and what their future career could even look like. Right now, what we have happening is students aren't being exposed early enough and it, allow, it doesn't allow them to fully participate in American society. You know, we're really creating some kind of permanent underclass. Here's an example. So years ago, the average age of an apprentice was around 19 years old, and that's a great age for a young person to get their hands wet, to get skilled up in a good job. Today, that average age is around 28 years old. So we see that shift, and that shift happened right around the time we stopped investing in shop class here in Oregon, in middle and high schools. And that, we can say now, was a bad move for everybody, but it really especially affected women and people of color. So the good news is this, Commissioner Avakian really under his leadership, together with a broad coalition of advocates, have worked hard to return shop classes to schools. And we're engaging more middle schools and high schools uh, and catching these young people while they're young and so that they don't drift and drift before finding a career path. So the, that effort alone has expanded access to hands-on learning to more than 90,000 students so far. And those programs, like the commissioner mentioned, are geared toward healthcare, construction, renewable energy, advanced manufacturing, so not just the, the fields we traditionally think of when we think of shop class. Commissioner Avakian, it sounds like you want to add something. We'd love Thank to you, Nicole. If you don't mind me just adding one additional thought to those great comments from Roberta. We know that the loss of these middle and high school programs had a much higher adverse impact on young women and, and students of color. Uh, but you know, we occasionally uh, help host um, uh, 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 job fairs, construction types of uh, fairs where students can come and kind of get their hands dirty and experience uh, you know, what it could be like to be in the trades. We did one a few years ago in Lane County over 500 high school students showed up to get on the, the back of a bulldozer or a backhoe, learn how to you know, hang on to a jackhammer. But here's the exciting thing, more than a third of them were young women. And I have to tell you something. I watched very closely, if you can picture this with me, um, the young men getting on to the backhoe, and their task, of course, was to bring that big arm down and dig out a hole and dump the dirt. And as they're getting in there and they're moving the, the, the stick around, to th I noticed that the instructors were moving about 30 feet away from the backhoe. <laughs> but when the young women got on, they had the dexterity and the patience and the temperament to just move that thing around. And on the very first try, they would dig a perfectly square hole and dump the dirt and then fill the thing back up again. I tell you, the young women are finding an interest in these new career paths, which lead to great uh, living wage jobs, and they're good at it. And in case... And in case you didn't know, the one added piece of really good news is yesterday the legislature committed another $2 million to the expansion of career education for these young people. Did you want to finish your comments, Roberta? I have a little more to add to the commissioner's comments. You know, we want to see Oregon do more to remove barriers to the apprenticeship programs we talked about, and a huge piece would be to increase supportive services such as subsidized childcare and, and easing that student loan burden that we see so many young people have. And these factors contribute to eliminating some of the difficulties that women and people of color face. You generally won't hear me talk about um, you know, a four-year college education not being for everybody. In fact, uh, what I can get behind is creating real options for folks to earn a living wage with or without a college degree. Great. So again, to, to you, Commissioner, um, just as Roberta discussed some of the recommendations, but the council has many recommendations on increased investment in paid leave, affordable child care, and increased minimum wage. How will Boley um, go about looking at these investments, prioritizing them, and then how might they be paid for? 
You know, the council has done a very good job of, of giving us a, a set of recommendations that could end the wage gap in Oregon. And in the coming months, the Bureau is going to analyze those, uh, sort through them very carefully, uh, meet with the business community and with, uh, with worker advocates, uh, and develop a real action plan for the state. But as we do that, uh, we all need to be considering what the workforce really looks like today because it's changing. Uh, women are the breadwinners or co-breadwinners in two-thirds of Oregon families right now. When we think of the minimum wage, the old stereotype of a high school kid working a few hours after school to get a little pocket change uh, just is no longer the reality. Today, the minimum wage worker uh, is likely a woman in her young 30s, and she may very well have a family at home. These factors need to be considered in the policies uh, that we move towards. And we consider when we consider cost, I think we should look at it this way. Let's consider the cost to all of us in not doing something about this. But if you want to talk about the money involved, let's take the example of the return of these 21st century shop classes, because that means dedicating additional resources right now to public education. It's a commitment of general fund dollars, and it is a serious investment in our economic future. The highly skilled workforce that we are going to create through this investment is going to attract employers bringing middle class jobs to Oregon, and that is not only going to contribute to greater purchasing power, which will support our local businesses, but it means more tax revenue going into the state to support public schools, health care programs, and the like. So let's explore that a little bit further with some of the specifics about who our minimum wage earners are. On one hand, you have President Obama, Obama calling to question if it's ethical to have people working 40 hours a week and still living in poverty. And on the other hand, you have advocates against minimum wage um, making claims. For example, Aaron Shannon, the director for small businesses at the Washington State Policy Center, recently said that less than 10% of minimum wage earners are single parents supporting children while speaking in opposition to increasing minimum wage. Um, Jessica, tell us who our minimum wage earners are in Oregon. Thanks for that question. Um, I think it's really important, actually, that we kind of tease into some of these details. There are a lot of misconceptions about, about who's earning minimum wage out there. Um, so I want to say that the minimum wage is the minimum for everybody, um, not just for single parents supporting children. Um, overall, an increase in the federal minimum wage to $10.10 .10 by July 2016, this is referred to as the Harkin-Miller proposal, um, it would likely impact about 18% of Oregon's workforce. So these are workers that are working either at minimum wage or in the very concentrated band of workers just above minimum wage. Um, basically, as you increase the minimum wage, there's kind of a cascading effect up the income ladder as folks making wages close to minimum wage are also adjusted up. So um, the Economic Policy Institute has done um, some thorough research into um, using the micro data from the current population survey, which is uh, where we get the unemployment rate from. So it's a very big national survey. Um, the EPI went ahead and, and did state by state numbers on who's earning at this level. And yes, um, they show that fewer than 10% of Oregon's minimum wage or close to minimum, wa close to minimum wage workers are single parents raising children. So that's true in Oregon and it's true in, in Washington. But if you look just at the group of single parents, the share that we could expect to be positively affected by an increase in the federal minimum wage is 21%. So one fifth of Oregon's single working parents would see a pay raise with this policy. The impact on some demographic groups is really pretty striking. For instance, the same study found that in Oregon, Hispanic workers make up about 20% of those that would be affected by an increase in the federal minimum. Of Oregon's Hispanic workers, however, 35% are in jobs that would be affected by such an increase. So that's more than one in three 
of Hispanic workers in Oregon that would see a pay raise. Most of the affected adults or affected workers will be adults. So there is this, um, this idea out there that all of the affected workers are teenagers earning pocket change, I think as Commissioner Avakian just said. Um, but it's not true. Um, actually in Oregon, it's about 13% of the minimum wage or close to minimum wage workers that are teenagers. Adults ages 40 and over account for 30% of the workers at this wage level. Workers living in families with income of less than 40,000 would be most affected. These workers account for 56% of the total affected workers. People in families making less than 40,000 a year. Almost half of the affected workers work full time. The impact would be greatest for workers that haven't completed high school. Just about half of those workers would be anticipated to see a pay raise. But these workers don't actually make up the majority of workers at this pay level. One third of Oregon's minimum wage and close to it workers have completed high school, and another 42% have some college in their backgrounds. 6% have a bachelor's or advanced degree. So to sum it up, the minimum wage isn't a single parent issue. This debate has real ramifications for nearly one fifth of Oregon's workers including people in many different circumstances and in all of our communities. So we have one last question, and I'm going to ask Josh to be very concise in his answer. So Oregon does have a higher minimum wage. Do our businesses who largely employ minimum wage workers make less money or employ less people than, than comparable businesses elsewhere? Um. Thanks, Nicole. And in honor of the time, I will be succinct in these remarks. Um, overall, it, 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 ha it seems to have a little bit of an impact. If you look at the cost of our fast food, it might skew just a hair bit higher than that. We spend the same amount of money on a per capita basis in fast food, but we do employ a few workers. Uh, overall, payroll accounts for 25% of sales as a ratio nationwide. It's 26% here in Oregon and Washington. So it's just one percentage point difference, but overall we do have maybe a fewer, one fewer worker per fast food restaurant or something like that. In terms of sit-down restaurants, uh, it's somewhat similar. Uh, payroll there accounts for 33% of sales nationwide. It's 35% here in Oregon. So it's just a little bit higher. Uh, Washington's somewhat similar. Overall, our leisure and hospitality employment on a full-time equivalent basis is 2 to 3 percent below the U.S. average. But again, our minimum wage is 25 percent higher. Our median wage in these food preparation occupations is 5 or 6 percent higher. So um, uh, Jessica talked about the cascading impact. It, it reaches all the way up to that median there, at least in terms of some of our food preparation workers. So there, there seems to be some impact a little bit. Uh, at Northwest Health Foundation, we actually support less access to fast food, so appreciate that. Um, right now, we're actually going to transition over and invite our members in the audience to ask questions. If you'd like to write a question on a card, please do so and wave it so that one of our City Club volunteers can get that from you. And if you'd like to verbally ask a question, uh, please go ahead and make your way to the microphone. We ask that you uh, share with us that you're a City Club member, and we ask that you keep your question less than 30 seconds, and please make it a question, and we will invite the first question now. Wynn Wakala, City Club member and also executive, executive director for FAST, which stands for Fight Against Sex Trafficking and Fight Against Slavery Slash Trafficking. And my question is to Brad. Um, can you talk a little a bit about labor trafficking in Oregon? Well, let me say first, when you and FAST have just done a tremendous job of keeping this issue on everybody's uh, screen. Um, uh, it's something that we always keep a careful eye out for at the Bureau. You know, it's our task to make sure that people get paid for the work they do, but we want working conditions to be good and we don't want to see people uh, that are uh, that are brought against their will into the state to work in substandard conditions and substandard wages. A key piece to fighting that in Oregon is to make sure that when any agency sees it, that they have methods of communicating well with other agencies. For instance, we don't do uh, criminal law enforcement, but in a situation of human trafficking, uh, we would make sure somebody got paid for the work they did and maybe would work with a law enforcement agency uh, to pursue criminal prosecution if that were the case. But communication uh, and education is, is the key. 
Next question, please. Hi, I'm Russell Bythetary, City Club member. And I really like this idea of the pay equity audit for all the reasons you mentioned, that it's systematic, it's evidence-based, it's organization-wide, and it brings people up instead of taking people down to achieve equality. So it's clearly the right thing to do. Um, but I wonder about the potential problem for resentment from the people who um, were benefiting from discrimination. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, but I wonder what are the best practices for how to go about doing it in a way that brings or has a higher chance of bringing the workplace together in, instead, of, um, instead of dividing it. Sunny. Thank you. So I think, I think that you raise a, an interesting issue. And I'm not sure that there would be resentment if people's wages would be going up. So I'm not sure you would see that resentment there that, um, that, you, that you talk about. Um, one of the things that we found when we were looking at international ideas was a study in Ontario as a best practice. And I would urge you to look at the report that we put out um, for the council. It's on page 34. And it's, um, it's a really great way. It was a voluntary effort that the, that the province did um, to look at how they did pay equity. And it was very proactive, so they didn't wait. It wasn't complaint driven. And I think that was something that was uh, very helpful. It was just an expected thing that employers, uh, public and private, were doing. Love to hear the next question. Hi, Joanne Kahn, City Club member. This is going to sound a little odd, but I'll propose it anyway. Uh, it has to do with the motherhood penalty that you were talking about. And you mentioned subsidized childcare as one possible solution, which really comes down to contributing to paying someone else to help raise your child. Why don't we have farm subsidies to encourage parents to actually spend time raising their children? We pay people to grow corn. Why not pay people to grow great kids? It looks like Roberta has an answer for us. Uh, that's a fabulous idea. Uh, you know, the reality is uh, folks, a lot of folks need to work. And the issue comes up when women who are supporting families need to work. And although that sounds wonderful, it likely would not be able to substitute for a working living wage. So I, great idea and let's subsidize women who need to work. Can we have our next question, please? Hi, my name is Mary Pivato, and I'm a member of City Club, and I just want to say thank you to the expert panel and to City Club for hosting this um, conversation, and it's great to see that our Bureau of, of Labor and Industries has some great ideas and how we can move forward. My question to the panel is, what do you think the state's role is, besides in the wage gap, in also providing the support and flexibility in our working environment to help mothers and everyone deal with the realities of, of caring for children and others, like paid sick leave, flexible work um, protections? Commissioner Ravakian? Well, it's a, ter it's a terrific question, and we should always be assessing what, you know, what's the state's role in these types of things. And the Bureau of Labor and Industries has a long history of being involved with best practices in workplaces. In addition to the ideas you heard today, we have provided toolkits for employers under the relatively new uh, domestic violence uh, law, where uh, victims of domestic violence need to be accommodated for the things that they need to do to deal with that particular situation. And uh, we regularly help train and work with employers in that type of a situation. The same thing with the fairly recent law in breastfeeding in the workplace where uh, new types of flexible schedules were needed to accommodate mothers who were back on the job. And, and those things are working very successfully, not solely through an enforcement mechanism, but through a partnership with businesses to help them navigate their way through the law and adopt best practices. And that type of a cooperative relationship is the kind of thing that we're aiming ourselves towards with the wonderful ideas that the council has presented. Tom Karwaki, City Club member. Approximately 18, 20% of the Oregonians also are on food stamps and so forth. What would be the implications of an increase of the minimum wage 
to the impacts on other public expenditures and improvement in schools, and what are we doing about wage theft, and what's your bureau doing with wage theft and making sure that we don't have that happen in this uh, state? Josh? Sounds good, thank you. Um, there's an interesting new study that just hit the press either yesterday or today on that exact, that exact topic, and it falls in line with a pr uh, proposal that's coming out of California at the same time. It's who should pay some of these low-wage workers? Should it be the employers themselves through a higher minimum wage, or we want to go the current route where we're going with increased subsidies and increased uh, food stamp programs and expenditures via that, right? Who should pay it? Uh, and, and so it's kind of an either-or situation. Do you, want, if, do you want to face higher taxes? and subsidize the things like we're currently doing, or do you want to pay more out of the, uh, from the employers themselves? And the, the new research that just came out said somewhere around $42, $46 billion reduction in food stamp usage uh, due to the $10, $10 proposal at the federal level. Uh, that's somewhere on the magnitude of four, five times larger than what the food stamp uh, cuts that Congress just passed are, and this is via the minimum wage as opposed to actually cutting them directly. Commissioner Abakian. With respect to your question on wage theft, we're talking a lot about flexibility in the workplace, flexible work schedules, accommodating the specific needs of workers. One area where there is no flexibility is when a worker performs work for the benefit of an employer, they need to be paid. Now, that you address that in two ways. One is by helping to train employers what the law is so they inadvertently don't do something that harms their employee. But the other is, for those employers that do intentionally rip off their employees, you need a system of enforcement that can move fast and be effective. And that is what we do at the Bureau of Labor and Industries. About 5,000 investigations a year that has resulted in recent years in about $20 million back into the pockets of workers who had been ripped off on the job. And this will be our last question. Hi, thank you for your discussion today. I'm Peter Recoy, City Club member. Uh, Josh, you talked about the Gini coefficient and how Oregon compared with other states. I'm not sure everybody uh, has a clear idea of what that means, but Congressional Budget Office found that between 1979 and 2000, income grew by 275% for the top 1% of households. During that same period, it grew by just 18% for the bottom Again, 275% growth for the top 1% of households, and over that same period, 18% for the bottom. Should we be concerned about this? And are any of these programs, <laughs> such as returning shops to high school, going to appropriately address that? Thank you. That is a great question, um, and I, I will skirt it a little bit, um, as a good economist should. Uh, you know, it certainly is a concern in the sense that you want, you want there to be enough jobs out there and enough income to support families and lifestyles and things like that all across the income spectrum, all across educational attainment levels um, to the extent that we're not doing that. And so the standard of living for the average or the median worker and the lower wage workers is declining to an extent that um, it's bad in, for society overall. Uh, that is a big concern. And when we talk about economic mobility, the opportunity to work your way up through hard work and getting a degree and reaching the higher wages, um, there's a lot of social cohesion and social integration variables that are statistically significant along with that improved economic mobility. So if we are segregating ourselves based on income and neighborhoods and social life and things like that, it is corresponding with lower economic mobility overall. So in that sense, uh, I think the data do show that it is uh, a concern for economic economic growth overall. Commissioner Bakken, did you want to comment? What you're describing is something that we're experiencing this state which is devastating to families and that is uh, a poverty class that is growing, an ultra wealthy class that is growing, and a burden that is unprecedented being placed on the backs of middle class families. I want to tell you a very short story of my trip to Bend recently where I visited a terrific place called the Family Kitchen. Uh, they provide about 800 meals a week for families in need. And I asked them, what kind of folks are you seeing come in uh, to the kitchen? And they said, well, there's a veterans camp outside of town and the war veterans come in for a hot meal and we have a transient youth population and when it's cold, they come in to get a meal and get warmed up. And oh, in the third week of every month, we see the Walmart families. Because they're not making enough money, 
as they see full-time jobs go to part-time jobs and permanent jobs go to temporary jobs to make it through the end of the month, we need to take a serious look at the tax laws and the shareholder laws in this, company, in this country that incentivize companies to ship middle-class jobs overseas to the detriment of our middle class in this country. At this time, we'd like to invite our president, John Horvuk, to close us out for the afternoon. Unfortunately, we have run out of broadcast time for further questions, and we'll have to close for today. And as we do, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to our panelists, Commissioner Bradovakian, Josh Lehner, Jessica Nelson, Sonny Pettit, Roberta Phillips-Robbins, and Nicole Mayer. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you.